Both the Roman Empire and early Christianity went through some very scary times, but nothing prepared either of them for the chaos that ensued during the 3rd century crisis. From barbarian invasions from the north to Persian invasions from the south, Christian persecutions, peasant rebellions, and countless civil wars, the 3rd century crisis was so impactful that historians cite this crisis as the single transformational event that transitioned the Roman Empire out of classical antiquity and into the late antiquity time period. And Christians who at the time were a small but faithful religious minority would be persecuted empire-wide, on a scale that had never occurred before. These persecutions that we will discuss were the most severe persecutions that the Christians had ever faced up until then and their effects on early Christianity, which we will examine, are still being debated today. We will be discussing what key issues caused the 3rd century crisis and the major events that followed, including two major Christian persecutions and how they affected early Christianity, as well as the temporary breakup of the empire, its inevitable reunification, and the emperor who brought the crisis to an end. The 3rd century crisis was a period from 235 to 284 AD, when the Roman Empire almost collapsed due to invasions, civil wars, and inflation. It was a time when the power shifted from the senatorial aristocracy and towards the armies. But it's important to make the distinction between the actual root problems and the symptoms of those root problems. All these symptoms are really caused by only two root issues that face the empire. The first root problem is the sheer size of the Roman Empire, who at its peak expanded all of the Mediterranean coastline, and all the way to Britain. And this became unmanageable, even though Rome spent over 60% of its entire imperial budget on the military, Rome could still not enforce its authority over all of its claimed territories, and that's what really matters. Whenever Rome wanted to defend one province, it had to ignore another province. The Roman legions were also scattered across huge land masses, and when reinforcements were called to assist local troops against an invasion or a civil war rebellion, they would often arrive too late. And this weakness was exploited by both the Persians and the barbarians who sat on the Roman borders. Whenever the barbarians from the north invaded western Rome, we will see the eastern Roman armies neglect the eastern provinces and allow the Persians to walk in, take that land, over and over again, and vice versa. The second root reason for the crisis of the 3rd century is that there was no clear way of transitioning the imperial power from one current emperor to the next emperor. And this had been since the beginning of the Roman Republic, where there was no clear rules or methods for the imperial succession. And this is really because the empire was an illusionary republic. During the early Principate, to become the emperor and stay emperor, you had to be approved by the Senate be somewhat popular with the Roman citizenry, and be accepted by enough of the military to enforce your authority. A family connection to the previous emperor was also very beneficial. There was often also a habit of the empire's child becoming the next emperor, but it wasn't the ultimate factor in the way a formal system of hereditary succession would be. Sometimes an emperor would choose a future successor who would apprentice alongside the sitting emperor to get a feel for what was to come, and these were called Caesars. But again, none of this was engraved into Roman law. It was just tradition. Technically speaking, if a large enough army proclaimed their general to be the new emperor, and they won enough of the ensuing civil wars, they could force the Senate to approve their general, and that general would become the replacement or the new emperor. And these are what we call usurpers, an illegitimate claimant to the imperial throne. And throughout the 3rd century crisis that lasted just 50 years, there were over 54 of these usurpers, each causing multiple civil wars, and 26 of them became legitimate emperors, who each averaged a reign of just one to one and a half years. Now the official cause of the 3rd century crisis was in 235 AD, when Emperor Alexander Severus is assassinated by his own troops. However, we should quickly go over why the Roman troops killed the Severan dynasty's last emperor, Alexander Severus. The reasons for why Severus's troops killed him goes back to 233 AD, when Emperor Severus goes eastward in an attempt to stop the Sassanid Empire's expansions. Now, the Sassanid Empire, or more loosely defined as the Persian Empire, was Rome's most feared enemy. 
The Persians were eyeing the Mediterranean Sea with really a lust, and as we saw in the Great Schism video, Persia will launch an all-out war very soon that does end up swallowing the southern half of the Mediterranean. But in this video, we will only see the early beginnings of this great rivalry unfold between these two great empires. And when Severus goes out east in an attempt to stop the Sassanids' expansions, Severus's armies suffer a series of humiliating losses, and this is largely blamed on Severus's military inexperience. And just a year later, in 234 AD, while the Roman armies are in the east fighting the Persians, the barbarians realize that the west is now neglected, and they invade the Roman Empire. But interestingly, it's not this invasion that makes Severus's troops unhappy with him, but it's actually Severus's response to the barbarian invasions. Severus attempts to bribe or pay off the Germanic conquerors to leave the Roman territories, but this was outrageous and offensive to the Roman armies, who felt that the Germanic invaders ought to be punished with a military conquest for intruding and looting the Roman territories. And so, on March 19th, 235 AD, Severus was assassinated by his own troops, and Maximus Thrax, a military general, was proclaimed emperor, becoming the first usurper in the crisis. And this starts a series of civil wars that will continue for the next 50 years, and these Roman civil wars are where the armies attempted to proclaim their own generals as the rightful emperor, called the usurpers, as we talked about earlier. And this new emperor, Emperor Maximinus, becomes the first of what we call the Barracks Emperors. And the Barracks Emperors, or Soldier Emperors, are military leaders who were proclaimed emperor by their troops, despite the fact that they didn't have any political experience, no formal education, and no hereditary claim to the throne. But instead, they simply had the raw support of large armies. And for the next 50 years, the main source of power is taken from the aristocracy and into the hands of the armies. And just three years later, we see a perfect example of these usurpers causing chaos and civil wars throughout the empire. Throughout the year 238 AD, there were six claimants, six men who claimed to be the Roman emperor, who were each supported and backed by their army. And these usurpers create massive chaos and destruction as they battle each other. This constant chaos and uncertainty is traumatizing to the Roman citizens who have always prided themselves on the fact that Rome was a stable and peaceful empire with very little civil unrest. But over time, each of these illegitimate emperors were assassinated, and then in would come the next military general, claiming to be the emperor, only to be assassinated again by a rival claimant to the throne, and on and on. And for the next 50 years, the main source of power was not in the hands of the aristocracy, but in the hands of the armies. These emperors were generally too busy focusing on keeping their own power than to enforce their religious views of paganism onto religious minorities. But this soon changes in 249 AD, when Trajan Decius is proclaimed as emperor by his armies after killing Emperor Philip I. And unlike many of Decius' predecessors during this crisis, Trajan Decius was not a barracks soldier emperor. He was, in fact, a very prominent senator before he became the emperor. And Decius uses his political and senatorial connections and experience to pass a series of edicts requiring that all Roman inhabitants make a public sacrifice to the pagan gods at a temple, in front of an approved government official. And Decius mandates these sacrifices for a number of reasons. One reason is a simple hatred for the emperor he had killed, Philip I, who was often deemed to be a Christian or at least sympathetic to the Christians. However, another reason is that because there are unimaginable amounts of chaos, infighting, and divisions during this crisis, that Decius is attempting to strengthen the empire and instill order by uniting the entire empire under the umbrella of a shared and common identity, and that being paganism. Decius is trying to revert Rome back to its old pagan world days. The final reason for the mandatory pagan sacrifices is has to do with the plague that was sweeping through the known world at the time. We now know that this plague was either smallpox or measles, but we still call it the Cyprian Plague, named after St. Cyprian who was the Bishop of Carthage. And the Cyprian Plague had begun in 249 AD, and was killing around 5,000 Romans a day. And pagan mythology went that if there was a public area or group of people performing a sacrifice, and that there were a few individuals who chose not to take part in the sacrifice, 
then this may anger the gods and cause them to seek revenge. And this seems to be what Decius saw, that this plague was a message from the pagan gods showing their outrage and their anger that people were not sacrificing to them, and that the entire empire was not completely submitted to the pagan gods. And so Trajan Decius passes the edict mandating all Roman inhabitants to perform a public pagan sacrifice, and those who do will each receive a Roman libellus, which was essentially a single sheet of paper officially acknowledging that you had performed a pagan sacrifice, signaling that you were united along with all the other good pagans. The libellus also included the name of the government official who had witnessed your sacrifice. Usually these sacrifices involved the person offering a libation to a pagan god, which was the pouring of a liquid, often an ancient perfume. Now it's unclear if Christians were targeted directly by Decius. Christians were certainly not exempted from the forced sacrifices. In fact, the only religious minority in Rome that was exempt from these sacrifices were Jews. And this was in accordance with the law Julius Caesar had enacted, which allowed Jews to follow their traditional religious practices. Now, while most historians agree that Decius did not intend to disproportionately persecute Christians, this is certainly what ended up happening. Christians who made up roughly 3-5% to of the Roman Empire's population at the time either refused to do the sacrifice or simply did not show up, and thus they did not have their libellus to show for. And so indirectly, Christians were the main group to get caught up in this edict, refusing the sacrifices. And because, as we talked about earlier, there was this reoccurring theme in the pagan world, that if a group of people are performing a pagan sacrifice, but even just one individual is not, then this would be insulting to the pagan gods. And so Christians are imprisoned, tortured, and killed. Saint Cyprian, who was killed in the next Christian persecution that we will talk about, even wrote in one of his famous essays that the Decian persecution that was unleashed at the onset of the plague sought out Christians as scapegoats. These empire-wide persecutions didn't just kill countless numbers of faithful Christians, but more strategically, they also caused entire church congregations to divide over whether or not Christians who had performed pagan sacrifices and who had lapsed in their faith should be allowed back into the church. When high-ranking church leaders and priests were being tortured, many of them were given the choice to end their torturing in exchange for handing over the church's gospel to the authorities so that they could burn it. And the priests who did this began to be called traitors by the Christians. Traitors is actually the root word that we have derived the modern word traitor from. A traitor is essentially a negative name given to Christians who delivered the scriptures or the goods of the church to their persecutors to save their own lives. Generally, there would only be one gospel in each village's church, and that gospel would be handed over to that church's leader, or priest, who had to keep it safe. And this is a big deal, this is a big responsibility to be entrusted with your village's gospel. Remember, this is a time way before the invention of the printing press, and completed books, let alone the Bible, were extremely expensive to make and very hard to come by. And more often than not, when under the extreme pain of torture, priests would give up the secret location of the one or maybe the two gospels that they had been entrusted with. And this question of whether or not we should allow these traitors back into the church actually causes several schisms during this time. During the Decian persecution, a Christian sect called Novatianism was gaining members who followed the beliefs of the theologian named Novation. And Novation has a very strict view of traitors. And his position was that all lapsi, those who had lapsed in their faith, and performed pagan sacrifices under the pressure of Roman persecution, should be refused readmission to the church's communion. And Novationism began when Pope Fabian was beheaded during the Decian persecutions. And Novation strongly opposes the election of Pope Cornelius to replace Pope Fabian. And Novation opposed Cornelius becoming Pope because he believed Cornelius was too liberal in accepting lapsed Christians, those who had betrayed their fellow Christians or the faith entirely. In fact, later on, particularly under Diocletian and his great Christian persecutions, we will see another church schism between the two Christian wings, centered again on the status of traitor clergy. 
those clergymen who had handed over the gospel to escape torture and death. The Donatists will argue that traitors should not be welcomed back until they are rebaptized and retake their oaths of priesthood, and only then could they be reordained and take back their office in the church. This stems from Donatism's core principle that Christian clergy must be faultless in order for their ministry to be effective and their prayers and sacraments to be valid. This is clearly a much more liberal approach to dealing with the traitors than the Novationists, who argued that traitors could never come back. And these Decian persecutions continue on on a scale that was empire-wide for 18 long months. But it does finally come to an end. In June of 251 AD, during the persecutions, Decius marches his armies to take back the territories that the Goths had taken, parts of what is now modern-day Turkey. And this is the Battle of Arbatus, which took place in the second week of June in 251, where Decius and his army were soundly defeated by the Goths, and Decius becomes the first Roman emperor to die on the battlefield. And after Decius's death, his successors stop enforcing the edict, and the edict ultimately ceases, bringing an end to the forced pagan sacrifices and the torturing and persecution altogether. However, peace was shortly lived for the Christians, and just six years later, Christians will find themselves being persecuted, but this time deliberately. In 253 AD, Valerian's armies defeated Aemilian, a usurper whose armies had killed Emperor Gallus. And the Senate quickly approves of Valerian becoming emperor. And the Senate is actually kind of excited or hopeful at the fact that Valerian has become emperor, because Valerian was not the usual 3rd century crisis barracks emperor, soldier emperor. Valerian was part of the aristocracy and was a prominent senator himself. And to the senators, Valerian is really one of them. And the Senate thought that, possibly, Valerian could bring the power back from the armies to the senatorial aristocracy. And the Senate hoped that Emperor Valerian would bring together his political experience and his high approval he had among the armies and unite the empire and bring an end to this period of crisis that we now call the 3rd century crisis. But, like all Roman emperors wishing to make a name for themselves and display early dominance, Valerian starts a series of campaigns out east, and he does this in order to take back the Roman territory that the Persians had captured under the leadership of Shapur I. And Shapur is really a military genius. It was under Shapur that the Sassanid Empire had conquered the entire Roman provinces of Syria and Armenia, as well as major strategic cities such as Antioch. In 257 AD, while Valerian was still out east commanding armies against Shapur, Valerian sent two separate letters to the Senate, demanding that the Senate takes firm actions against Christians. The first letter was sent in 257, ordering that Christian clergy be forced to perform pagan sacrifices to the pagan gods, or face banishment from the empire. However, the next year, in 258, Valerian sends another letter to the Senate, but this letter is much more harsh. Valerian very clearly orders the Senate to have all Christian leaders executed. The letter continues ordering all Christian senators and Christian knights to perform sacrifices to the pagan gods, or lose their positions, lose all of their property, and if they continue to refuse, that they be executed as well. And it's unclear exactly why Valerian sends these letters to the Senate, and why he's so intent on wiping out only Christians specifically. But whatever his reasons, these persecutions surpass the Decian persecutions in their intensity and lethalness, killing countless Christians. Among them were some very famous Christians. St. Cyprian, a famous Latin scholar who we heard about earlier, was executed in Carthage. Pope Sixtus II and St. Lawrence were also burned to death in Rome. And once again, Christians are being persecuted, except this time it's much more deliberate and it does not include any other religious minorities. The Valerian persecution is empire-wide, and it is very unforgiving. In fact, Novation, the founder of Novationism, who we talked about earlier, was killed during this persecution in the year 258, after refusing to perform pagan sacrifices, holding himself to his own strict standards. Meanwhile, back out east, Valerian had some early military successes, taking back the Syrian and Armenian provinces, including Antioch, and the Sassanids had retreated to Edessa, 
and Valerian decides not to wait for reinforcements, but instead chases Shapur, and this results in the Battle of Edessa that takes place in May 260 AD in modern-day southern Turkey. And Valerian and his troops are completely defeated, and Valerian becomes the first Roman emperor in Roman history to be captured. According to the ancient Roman historians Lucius Lacantius and Aurelius Victor, Shapur humiliated Valerian, and he does this by using the former Roman emperor, Valerian, as a human stepping stool whenever Shapur needed to hop onto his horse. And once Valerian had been taken as prisoner, Valerian's successor, Gallienus, repeals the edicts against Christians, and once again peace is temporarily restored for Christians. And Christians often gleefully use these two subsequent events as evidence for the scriptures that if you harm God's people, that God will humble you and lower your status before your own people. In 260 AD, Emperor Gallienus had to go out east to squash a usurper rebellion in a civil war. And while the emperor focuses his armies out east, from the north, the Alemanni and the Franks invaded the Western Roman Empire. And amidst all this chaos, while the Roman Empire is scrambling to put up a defense, a Roman general by the name of Marcus Postumus defects and declares his army's independence and establishes the Gallic Empire, comprising of the provinces of Gaul, Britannia, and later on also Hispania. And out eastward, things are also not going too well for the United Roman Empire either. Due to the Roman army centralizing in Rome, attempting to get their preferred general into the position of emperor, these eastern frontier provinces have become largely abandoned, and thus subjects to Persian invasions and conquests, who attempted to take Syria and other provinces. And in 260 AD, Odenathus, a wealthy merchant and the governor of the Syrian province, sees assassinated troops inside his Roman province, and in a response, he creates an army made up of peasants and contract soldiers to push back against the Persian expansions, and he actually surprisingly wins. Odenathus recaptures all the Roman lands that the Sassanids under Shapur had taken. Odenathus then declares himself the king of kings of the east. Now contrary to many mainstream beliefs, Odenathus does not commit any treasonous acts against Rome. In fact, he makes his loyalty to Rome and the Roman emperor very clear when he crushes several usurpers who had declared that they were the true emperor, which Emperor Gallienus had thanked Odenathus for. It's best to view Odenathus as more like an independent monarch, defending the eastern Roman territory from the Sassanids, all while the official Roman armies were too busy fighting the northern barbarians and vying for power in Rome. However, things do change and become treasonous when Odenathus is assassinated in Antolia in 267 AD, and his ambitious widow, Queen Zenobia, decides to conquer several bordering eastern Roman provinces. And while the Roman armies are up north fighting the barbarians, Zenobia takes her newly conquered provinces and combines them with what her husband had independently protected and establishes the Palmyrene Empire in 270 AD. This treasonous act marks the official splitting off from the Roman Empire. And this new Palmyrene Empire comprises of the Roman provinces of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and large parts of Asia Minor. In the year 270 AD, things are not looking good for the Roman Empire. At this time, all that remained of the Roman Empire were the provinces between the Gallic Empire and the Palmyrene Empire, which were centered in Italia. The new ruler, Emperor Aurelian, was now facing threats from enemies on all sides. Even worse, Rome, once considered safe, was now exposed and didn't even have any defensive fortification. The first thing Aurelian does is strengthen his authority within the Roman territories to avoid any possible civil wars. He quickly shuts down two usurpers and then heads out north to push the Vandals out of Roman territory. Then late in 270, Aurelian defeated the Alemanni, one of Rome's most feared enemies, at the Battle of Fano, and then he pushes back the Juthoni at the Battle of Pavia in 271. And Aurelian, anticipating more attacks from the northern barbarians, decides to construct a massive fortification system, which we now call today the Aurelian Walls, which you can still see today. With the Germanic tribes largely pushed out and defeated, 
and the defensive system constructed, Aurelian now focused his attention on reuniting the Roman Empire. In 272, Aurelian begins the reunification process and starts with the Palmyrene Empire. Because Queen Zenobia, who rules from the city of Palmyra, had recently stopped the shipments of grain that all of Rome relied on to make their bread. It took less than one year for Aurelian to defeat Zenobia and her empire, recapturing the empire's eastern provinces and making Zenobia and her son walk through the streets in golden chains. In 274, the victorious Aurelian refocused his attention out west. Aurelian's predecessor Claudius II had already recaptured the province of Hispania from the Gallic Empire but Gaul and Britannia were yet to be recaptured. The most impressive part about Aurelian taking the Gallic Empire is that he did it largely through skilled diplomacy. The Gallic Emperor Tetricus was willing to abandon his throne and give up Gaul and Britannia to the Roman Empire, but he told Aurelian that he could not submit to him publicly. So they conspired a planned out battle in which Tetricus simply ran to the Roman camp, deserting his army and because the Gallic army was leaderless, Aurelian easily defeated the Gallic army. This is known as the Battle of Chalon. And afterwards, Aurelian returned to Rome after beating usurpers, numerous Germanic tribes, reuniting the Roman Empire, and building incredible fortifications. The Senate granted him the title Restorator Orbis, Restorer of the World. When Aurelian dies in 275, the chaos of the 3rd century crisis immediately resumes, and over the next 9 years there will be a total of 6 emperors assuming the throne. However, this all changes in 284 when Diocletian defeats all of them and restores order and stability to the empire through his political, economic, and military reforms, most notably the invention of the Tetrarchy. Under Diocletian, Christians will face a religious persecution that is worse than both the Decian and Valerian persecutions combined. The Diocletianatic persecutions, as they're called, will last for over a decade, and it will be the worst persecution that the Christians have faced up until then, which we will learn about in our next video about Diocletian's reforms and the great Christian persecution. However, these great persecutions will also pave the way for a positive force, Constantine the Great, who converts to Christianity himself and passes the Edict of Milan, legalizing Christianity in the Roman Empire forever. If you found this video informative, please subscribe to our channel and also consider liking this video and sharing it to those who may be interested. Thank you so much for watching.